Hi, welcome to the ZP Developer Zone on eight, at 8am 8 on the 22nd of June 2023. So we do this webinar every week and it's intended really to sort of answer questions that have come in um, during the week. So let me jump into it. If you're interested in biosensing, electrochemical biosensing in general, there's the ZP Academy. I must admit, I haven't put a link onto this, um, but if you Google um, ZP Academy, hopefully you'll find it. There's two free courses there that which could be useful for anyone sort of generally interested in the science of electrochemical um, biosensing. Um, we do do this webinar once a week, and we do have collaborations. Um, you will see that we have collaborations with sort of universities um, around the world. We do offer jobs. We've had two hirings this week, and um, we do have our ZP Developer Zone, which is a sort of dedicated website um, to the Biosensor community. And most importantly, we do have workshops, and we also now do have a conference as well, but I will touch upon that um, during this, um, let's say, webinar today. Let me go quickly and just say that we do have workshops. And so, for example, next week um, in Coventry, we are having a biosensor workshop. For example, um, we do cover amperometry, potentiometry, um, voltammetry, um, impedance spectroscopy. And everyone gets, for example, to make a glucose sensor and to test the glucose sensor. And we then do have a workshop um, of the same type in Norway. I think it's on the 11th and 12th of September. And I know it's the 11th to 12th of September because on the 13th and 14th of September, we're having a conference and I will talk about that in the next slide. Um, we do have these workshops also running in Coventry in the UK, um, in Norway, as I've mentioned. We do have our large conference coming and we do have, for example, a workshop also running in um, France as well. As I say, there is actually a large um, conference being um, in part organized by Zimmer and Peacock, though we want this to be independent of us in the long run. So we call it the S3 Conference, which stands for the Scandinavian Sensor Summit. Um, and it's on the 13th and 14th of September in Horten in Norway. And we describe it as a sort of digitization for a sustainable future. If you want to improve anything in life, and this imp you know, includes the environment, um, industrial processes, biosensor, I'm oh, sorry, um, bioprocesses, anything, you know, let's say anything, then measuring it is the first step in improving it. Because when you can measure it, you can improve it, you can control it. Um, so measurement and therefore sensors is really important for um, sustainability. And digitization for sustainable future for us doesn't just mean, um, it means industrial process, environmental processes, agriculture, aquaculture. Um, it's a conference that's based more around um, applications than necessarily just the strict science of um, what it is we're doing. Um, I have put this link underneath the video um, on the YouTube um, channel. So some of the questions that have come in this week, um, question number one was really around um, the resistance of a carbon ink. Somebody's trying to make a wearable biosensor and they're talking about their carbon ink, so I will discuss that. Somebody else is trying to make a wearable biosensor um, really around um, sodium sensing, so I will talk about that as well. Somebody else is asking about biosensors for bioreactors. Um, uh, particularly pH and glucose, and I will cover that. Um, somebody else is looking to coat um, polypyrrole on their um, on an electrode, and I will discuss some tip, tricks and tips on that. Somebody else is interested in our 96 well plate and wonders if it's compatible with another sort of potential stat that they have, um, so I will cover that. And then somebody else is trying to make a wearable wrist biosensor, which is really linked, not linked, it's different questioners, but um, same thought so question two and question six um, are sort of linked and the inquirers on both those questions should sort of you know watch both those um, answers let me go a quick a bit quicker and say that somebody's trying to make a um, enzymatic glucose sensor um, actually this enzymatic glucose sensor will appear in a few more um, questions during this webinar and I suppose I just said it as well that um, we do hold workshops and in those workshops everyone gets to make a glucose sensor so if you're interested in baselining your glucose sensor versus for example what we do at ZP then that workshop is for you um, in order to answer your question which is is your um, carbon ink conductive enough and I can see here that you have a conductivity or resistance of 150 ohm per square um, I actually did measure um, one of our 
um, carbon, one of our printed technologies, um, just to kind of have a check. So I measured across um, essentially the length of the working electrodes. I got 180 ohms and I, um, I had essentially four squares in that. So I, cal and I um, calculated that to be about 45 ohms per square, which tells me that you're not um, terribly off um, having the kind of conductivity that we have anyway. So I, you know, I know it's an order of magnitude difference, um, but I wouldn't sort of beat myself up over this. I mean, you're only three times our um, resistance. Now, I think your problem, now what you'll also notice is, and just watch um, some of these dots as I click around now. If I change the, the measurement to the actual point which I make electrical contact, the entire length of that is only 260 ohms. So I only get a few more so ohms um, be, even when I extend the length. Now what happens here, see, is that, um, and in our workshops, we do talk about the design of um, electrodes and screen printed electrodes. What we've done is we've extended the carbon ink down under what's called the dielectric, and then we have silver ink coming up. The reason I say that is because with your resistance, if you make both your working electrode and your conductive track out of this material, you may find that actually you do end up with too large a resistance. So your material itself is not, let's say, over resistive, but if you sort of use it for too long, um, you will end up with too large a resistance. And how do we overcome that in our scenario? We actually use a more conductive ink to carry some of that current. Um, for example, silver silver chloride is particularly, um, is much more conductive, depending on the, on the silver load, is much more conductive than carbon inks. Um, so no, you know, you can see what our conductivities are like. You can sort of compare your conductivity to ours. We make a perfectly good glucose sensor um, of these particular um, electrodes. Question, oh yeah, and here's some useful links. Um, I'm basically saying, look, if you really want to kind of get something to compare against, um, these are really quite super cheap um, electrodes. And I've also put um, two links here because one of them is the data sheet and the other one is how to get low cost carbon electrodes. Question number two, somebody's trying to make a um, sensor for measuring sodium on the body. Um, I do have um, a link here and I put that underneath the video as well. Um, and that will bring you to, you know, where are we at when it comes to, if somebody came to us and said, look, I wanna make a sodium sensor for um, the body. We obviously have sodium sensors um, in our portfolio. We would take that sodium sensor um, and essentially put it onto a wearable um, system like this. This is rather bulky, but in that system, um, and the videos will help you as well, it does actually have the potential stats, the uh, Bluetooth connectivity. Um, we're really good at app development at ZP, um, and essentially we can change it. We, we can make an app in a few hours because it's just a reconfiguring of, of an architecture that we already have. Um, we have what's called a Julie database. This is a proprietary database that anyone can open an account on. So it means we can get our data automatically to the cloud and, you know, sort of fix the problem, really. When I say fix the problem, that is what we would, I describe as an architecture for an MVP, a minimally viable product. Um, so the link is underneath. Um, configuration wise, there's lots of ways of configuring wearable biosensors. Um, there's um, transdermal, which is this kind of wire format. ZP does have um, a lot of glucose experience in this kind of format. This is called um, CGM, Continuous Glucose um, Monitoring. Just making sure that I... Yeah, Continuous Glucose Monitoring. We do have a microneedle format, which is relevant later on in question six. Um, and we do also have sweat um, patches as well, which could be very useful for a very non-invasive um, configuration. Um, and here's some images and all these, let's say, products and services exist. Um, as I say that we do have, a, I think, the, probably the world's largest range of electrochemical biosensors. And I'm going to reconfigure this page because actually the, the range is bigger um, than just this. Um, we do have this platform, as I say, called the ZP Accelerator, where we can take our sensors, put them into um, electronics, make the app. App connects to Julie. Julie sends the data to the cloud. And that really allows us then to start comparing results on this newly developed product versus results of a already FDA um, or CE marked product. And that really helps in the speed up of um, biosensor development. So one of the first starting points of Zimmer and Peacock actually is we were going to accelerate everyone's development um, of IVDs and wearables. And I think we've actually essentially achieved that. Again, if there's a link 
um, popping up. I will have also um, put the link underneath the um, video as well. Just to say that we have done, this is not sodium, but it is lactate, but we have done um, lactate monitoring where we've put um, wearable systems on people, uh, monitored the lactate um, using um, Bluetooth and got some really striking um, good results. And it's probably worth saying that this is either been discussed in previous webinars. I do discuss it at, when I'm giving sort of um, lectures and we also include it in our um, workshops as well. So here's some useful links, the sodium sensor, the sweat patch. Um, whoops, I didn't mean to click that, but no big issue. Um, and um, so here's the sweat patch and also some connectors as well. Depending on what kind of R&D potential stats you have, you will always need our seven millimeter connector. But if you click on this particular page, you will come to, um, you'll see that depending on the potential stats that you have, um, you might have banana plugs in that potential stats, which may be two mil, three mil or four mil, and you'll choose the connector um, accordingly. This is also useful for, for other people who, uh, if today you see some links to screen printed electrode, you will need these connectors to go between what we do and maybe the R&D potential stats that you have. Question number three is, um, so somebody, and this is something that I've been really interested in, I would almost say for, you know, it sounds really bad, but 20 years, um, one of my first, roles was actually designing bioreactors so i'm sort of very aware of um, measuring ph and um, glucose dissolved oxygen you know, um, in the bioreactors and then trying to control upon it um, and also this person wants to know about tell me a bit about your bio sensors for bioreactors and also there was a second question from the same company about um, autoclaving and um, glucose sensors as well um, I have a slide where I on glucose sensing, and I, uh, when that slide jumps up, I'll mention the autoclaving part. So with ZP, we have actually been using our sensors for quite a while, actually, to measure cell cultures and bioreactors. Uh, and we're currently engaged in quite a big program in the UK to kind of move our biosensing technology into bioreactors, but that um, program hasn't come to an end, so it's still a sort of a work in progress. Um, but it is going on um, and over the next let's say year you'll see more and more of this kind of technology popping out of ZP um, so we are working on it um, and um, this is genuine material off our website so this is sort of you know this material is kind of approximately sort of a yearish old um, there is one way of, of currently measuring um, let's say the pH and glucose in a bioreactor but unfortunately it means you have to sample for the bioreactor and put it onto our sensor so you sort of um you're manually transferring the material out and obviously you're not going to return the material to the bioreactor because you know it'll have essentially become contaminated but we have done that kind of work as well where we're doing sort of offline manual monitoring of a bioreactor this is glucose data um, and this is ph data and again if you see a link i will have um, put the link underneath the um, video as well um that platform, um, we call it Sense It All. It's really um, a big workhorse for us at ZP. Um, so we would take the um, glucose sensor, for example, um, take our Sense It All um, platform, and um, it has an app with it. And that means we can put a sample on. Um, the app tells the meter what to do. The meter gives the data back to Julie, and Julie um, will give um, a result. You know, if it's glucose, millimole, um, for example, is a fairly good unit um, for that pH. Obviously, you just get the pH unit. Um, so we do have that technology. One of the questions that will pop up is, you know, how robust are um, electrochemical biosensors? Glucose in particular is actually, a, and pH actually, I'd say, are really robust um, sensors. We are working, um, if you ever Google implantable sensors, Zimmer and Peacock, you will find that we've got quite a um, effort in implanting glucose sensors into fish um, and that's really going um, really quite well and we've been running for this sensor for over 125 days um, quick link here on that I just want to bring this up a little bit because the question was um, can you autoclave um, your um, glucose sensors by the way we do have aseptic manufacturing and we have do have the ability to sterilize but we cannot autoclave I don't think you can autoclave glucose sensors. If people say you can autoclave them, 
with every cycle of autoclaving, you're, you are going to be losing um, sensitivity. Um, this slide is taken from our workshops. I have mentioned that we do these workshops. We try to do them once a month, but there's at least one on the 11th or 12th in, of September in Norway. Um, and I only bring this up because the people asking the questions basically have a biology background, so you'll understand, you know, um, that actually we have an enzyme in there, which is perhaps the glucose oxidase, um, and therefore autoclaving. Uh, uh, autoclaving generally, I think, is about 120 degrees C for about 20 minutes. I think it's really too much um, thermal energy for our um, enzyme. I just realized now it's quarter past the hour, so I definitely need to finish on time, so I will um, go quick. So here's some links to the glucose sensor, here's some links to the pH sensor. I think the last point on this is that um, we do have these glucose and pH sensors and we do have experience in it. But really to support somebody in using these sensors in their bioreactor, it's really gonna take a little bit of a project with us. So I've linked to a, sort of a starting project with Zimmer and Peacock, which we kind of call a proof of principle. And if you see the link, it's underneath. Um, this is a question that's come in. Somebody's very interested. It's actually quite interesting, actually, when I read this now. Um, they want to do um, the electrochemical deposition, I presume, of um, polypyrrole from basically the pyrrole monomer. They want to have a certain thickness, three to four nanometers. They're asking here if KCL is a good, they say, um, solvent. Um, I would say it's really the electrolyte. It says what voltage is suitable to prepare such a thickness. It's a good point, actually. And I, and I do have that in the link. So let me go forward with this. So first of all, we did this, first of all, I think this paper is, this paper, this page is from 2017 and it's on our website. Um, this is some early work and I notice in that that we're cycling from minus 0.4 to 0.9 volts. So we're doing cyclovoltammetry um, and I can see that we're in water um, with a electrolyte, which wasn't KCL, it was lithium perchlorate, LiClO4. Um, so that was the kind of conditions that we were using in 2017. I did ask one of our guys, um, you know, we, we actually do um, polypyrrole depositions quite a lot. We're quite interested in, in, um, in them, both for um, enzyme work and also for uh, MIPS, molecular imprinted polymers. So I did say, what concentration are we using? He said, well, best practice is 0.1 molar. He says it's best to use acetonitrile, but acetonitrile is a really aggressive solvent. It will um, damage a lot of materials of construction. So I would generally actually be trying water. Um, he does suggest 0.1 ammonium perchlorate. Um, maybe that ammonium perchlorate is not soluble enough in acetonitrile, and that's why it's probably worth trying the lithium perchlorate. Um, he does say that in order to get, to, I know you wanted three to four nanometers, and he just did a back of the envelope calculation. And he just said, look, you have to pass one millicoulomb per centimeter squared to get a five nanometer thick coating. Um, you may not be fully understanding what I mean by one millicoulomb per centimeter squared. What's the size of your electrodes? If it's obviously, you know, one centimeter squared, then you need one millicoulomb. Um, what we're doing here is we're doing what's called uh, a, an application of Faraday's law. Charge is equal to moles times number of electrons times Faraday's constant. So we can approximate how much charge you need to pass in order to get a certain amount of material as deposited on the electrode. And if we know the surface area, we can measure that we can gather, we can calculate the depth. So that's the calculation we're doing. Um, what I would suggest is, look, you did mention gold electrodes. It's gonna take a lot of optimization to make this work. Um, I'm biased, but we do have the world's best um, gold electrodes. We actually do do um, polypyrrole de deposition on these quite a lot. Um, I think I'm going to mention, yeah, we do do um, deposition on these quite a lot. Um, something I'm not measuring here is, I'm mentioning here, actually I realize thinking about it is, um, you have to clean gold surfaces before you do the deposition. Um, something like mild acid will do it. Um, and then you will also need a connector as well. And the connector that you choose, and I have put a link to it, will depend on the potential stat that you have and the banana plugs that come with it. Question number five is somebody who's interested in our 96 well format. Um, and I'm really sorry because I kind of, I couldn't find the email, but I did save the image. They have an existing potential stat and unfortunately we're not compatible with it. Um, 
so you can't use sort of the palm says potential stats or the drums drop says potential stats um, and um, quick apologies but the quick answer is um, no we are supporting our own potential stats so this is a um, six channel potential stat it's a real beauty in terms of its um, size but we are definitely not supporting um, the other potential stats because um, we've had the experience they're not really going to do the job properly whoops and i should say there's a link to that potential stat as well question number six um yeah this is when people come to come to us and this is the same for question number two as well um wearable biosensors is probably the hardest thing you can one of the hardest things you can do in sensing um if i could put like a sort of i'm coming off i don't want to say i'm coming off script slightly here um but i do want to say that companies who are doing this kind of thing and want to do it well in the glucose space are raising over 100 million um, us dollars to do this um but that said um see question number two because a lot of the information i put in question number two is 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 pertinent i think question number two and question number three really your starting point with us would be quite a large project um and i think these large projects are like 330,000 euros and zp is actually quite a low cost partner for this because we're so experienced um but you know really you need to raise millions to do this kind of work i'm going to slightly come off script because i realized that the person who's asking questions about polypyrrole um the thing about um electrochemical deposition is people don't really know how to scale it um after you've done the um the lab work so i just wanted to say at zp we do have a um really cool um technology um for scaling manufacturing if the if the method of immobilization is um electrochemical deposition we have basically a robot that moves electrodes um can put them down into these essentially these um baths that's where we do the electroplating and then we or electrode deposition i should say and then we can move um the electrodes um, around a little bit i kind of came off script slightly on that one uh, but we do have um robots that then allow people once they've got their kind of lab work done the next question then is how am i going to scale this um and the answer is you can use um zp robots for example to do that when i say i, I came off script i'll just jump back into my slides and say for question number six you wanted a quick answer how to make a or what would it take to work with zp and it's the starting point would be a large project which i've put a link to um here um i also realized that your question in particular and we do have components that are good for what you want to do and we just recently just sold some of these micro needles so um and i put a link um on to that there so question number one the resistance of a carbon ink your carbon ink is generally fine um but if you try to use your carbon ink both as your working electrode and as your connecting line let's say and your contact pad you may find that the overall thing is too resistive if you need um, advice on designing electrodes come to one of our workshops and um, the guys on sodium sensors um, i put quite a few links there we have measured for example lactate in sweat it would be a really similar thing to do sodium in sweat biosensors for bioreactors um, this is a work in progress for ZP. We do have, we have been monitoring bioreactors, pH and glucose, um, and dissolved oxygen for some time. What I have in the public domain, I've put there. Um, if you really want to do this with us, it'll have to be a project, unfortunately. The polypyrrole coating, I think we've given you quite a lot of starting points there, and I hope that's sort of useful to you. The 96 well plate, unfortunately, is not compatible with that um, potential stat that you sent me an image of. I'm making that wrist biosensor. I think really everything I've put for question two is relevant for question six as well. And I basically, I just want to finish with thank you. Um, I do have to jump on to some other meetings now, but um, if you have any technical questions for ZP, as always, don't hesitate to reach out to us. Okay, thanks very much.